so the case studies on particle filtering that I'll be presenting uh, are uh, at various stages of publication pipeline, um, but uh, give some really exciting, uh, exciting insights into the potential for particle filtering. Uh, because of the fact that we need to present three case studies in uh, the morning here, uh, I'm going to go uh, quickly uh, through any one of them in my prepared remarks. However, um, as always, uh, I view the foremost um, goal of, of my uh, of, of leading these boot camps is, is being answering participant needs and questions. And so I would suggest that if you'd like to uh, request more detailed coverage of some of the materials, or if you'd like to advance questions or otherwise um, hear more about aspects of, of, of some of the case studies or have points clarified, please, please, please either speak up or, or use the chat and I'll try to be immediately responsive to that. I'd welcome that at any point um, during the presentations, especially because I'm going to be moving quickly um, for my basic narrative with these. This narrative will build on our experience of, uh, or, or our basic coverage of particle filtering from yesterday. Um, I'll try to hit on a few points, but I'm not going to go over the basics again, as I might if I were presenting these as self-contained case studies. That is, if I, um, if I were giving them at a conference or what have you. Um, and I would again welcome if, if you want a reminder of some aspect of particle filtering, please don't be shy about speaking up. I'm, I'm happy to, to address uh, those sort of questions as well. Okay, um, so uh, we have uh, three quite, quite different case studies um, here. And the first of them is going to be one that, that is going to bring together uh, on the one hand, particle filtering, and on the other, big data. Um, and it's one of great significance when it comes to understanding dynamics uh, of communicable disease, but, but also in, in some other areas as well. Um, uh, in the context of, of mental health and addictions, I'd argue some, some elements uh, of this are relevant. Um, and it has to do at, at a most basic level with um, the importance of understanding uh, behavioral dynamics beyond dynamics associated with biomedical factors like you know, progression of a condition or transmission of a pathogen. Um, so uh, in, uh, you know, within the last, if someone could turn off their, uh, put their mute on that'll be great um uh within the past decade um uh, a set of colleagues of mine um ross hammond a, a close colleague with whom i've taught quite a lot um as well as josh epstein then at at hopkins and others um contributed a thoughtful piece uh in in plus one about um about the coupled nature of contagions um, uh, having to do with spread at the one hand, contagion of pathogen, but also contagion of anxiety or fear. And they argued um, in this article that historically, if you were to look at the progression of pandemics um, or even some epidemics, uh, that they're best understood, the, the features of those pandemics or epidemics are best understood through the joint lens of two contagions, not just one. Um, the behavioral responses needed to be considered as endogenous to the system. That is, it, it wasn't just spread a pathogen and some fixed underlying system, um, but rather people's responses to it mediated, limited, or facilitated in some cases the spread of infection. And, and um, at the time they wrote this, their 
go-to case study was the 1918 flu pandemic, Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, and, you know, one of the cases to which they pointed was, I believe, for Philadelphia or Baltimore, whereby um, people's attempts to shield themselves from the pandemic um, uh, took place over many, many months. There was sort of self-quarantining going on. Um, uh, people hid out and, and tried to limit their exposure to others engaged in social distancing and mask use. But at some point, um, the number of cases dropped so much that they, um, they figured the pandemic was over. They came out in large numbers and mixed very freely. And in fact, there was a, um, an infamous um, celebration in the form of a parade for returning uh, servicemen from the First World War, um, where massive hundreds of thousands of, of individuals turned out um, for this victory parade, which they, in some sense, was also buoyed by the um, sense that the pandemic was now over. Um, but that parade um, became the scene of mass spread. And within 12 hours, um, there were horrendous numbers of fatalities that came from it. And um, uh, tragically, coffins were stacked in the streets. And um, people were known to have collapsed on the very afternoon of the parade following exposures. And so they argued that, you know, to really understand this, you, you need to understand the, the progression of infection, um, the natural history of infection, say, between susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered categories. But you want to think as well about people's behavior as shielding them from, um, or in other cases, not shielding them from, from infection. So someone might, for example, become concerned um, and remove themselves due to concern in a way that would lower their contact rates. Um, but people might become anxious at the same time that they get infected and become an infra afraid infected. Um, uh, and someone like that might not shield themselves from infection, but they might, through removal, shear, shield others from infection. Um, and so with this eye in mind, with this idea in mind, um, this lens in mind, they, they created two models. One, a compartmental model like that here. Um, the other, a, an agent-based model. A and they explored both. Um, and as is the tradition in, in areas of mathematical epidemiology, they, they uh, denoted each of these with a, a brief uh, state variable um, characterization, and they they introduced the equations. And actually, later we found a bit of a, an issue with some of those equations, but corrected it, and it didn't didn't adversely impact um, any of their findings. It was just it was more of a of a technical issue about uh, uh, about uh, possible risk for adaptation of them. Um, now, we took these equations and we introduced them into a particle filter type of context. So we we introduced random walks. Remember, particle filter models need to have a certain requisite humility. They need to be open to uh, a diversity of views about the underlying situation. You don't want them to all have one groupthink view. You want, you want a diversity of perspectives. And particles represent these different hypotheses. And you want this requisite variety of hypotheses. And, and the way one key way to introduce that is by having stochastics. And so we, we had stochastics associated with five variables uh, listed here, include contact per day, removal rate, uh, fraction of incidents that's reported, et cetera. And this was some years back, but um, it's very common. And I, I can't remember for this particular case, but it's very common when we when we have this random walk that it's within some bounds, some small bounds perhaps of, of sort of plausible ranges of the parameters or what have you. Um, so some of these, uh, so if we think about the state of the system at any one time, if we think about 
what is the situation right now. Um, uh, a number of elements can be specified for this. For each particle, we have a certain number who are infected and frayed or removed due to fear of infection or infective right now or susceptible right now. Those would be some elements of the state vector, um, which kind of bundles together all the information you need about the current state. But then there are some aspects of that state vector that come from this as well, these dynamic parameters that evolve, that in some sense re represent um, uh, an aspiration to model humility of, of sort of having a degree of, of recognition that this model doesn't, doesn't have the full situation characterized. Um, so the research question here is, um, uh, that we were interested in exploring was um, despite, so could we tap for a situation like this, could we explain dynamics observed during an earlier pandemic? Again, this is almost a dozen years, or sorry, almost uh, 10 years old now. It, it, it was uh, many years ago. And uh, the, uh, pandemic that was fresh in our minds at that point was H1N1. Um, and this was also one of the first applications of particle filtering in our group. Um, and so we were wondering, could we account for more recent pandemic than the flu pandemic of 1918? Could we account for the H1N1 pandemic in this way? And I was particularly interested, could we look at using some aspect of big data to identify um, aspects of people's ideation, whether they were afraid or fearful, et cetera. We look to social media to give us clues as to those dynamics, um, even as we might look to publish case reports to give us to, to clue us into aspects of progression of infection, for example. Um, and we are particularly interested in using Twitter and search, search query volumes. Um, now, um, getting that Twitter his, uh, time series from, um, from that time frame was uh, financially infeasible. Um, this was at a time when Twitter wasn't uh, as open to academic uh, research accommodations and uh, we were quoted many thousands of dollars to to get that per month, I think. Um, I think it was about $1,000 per month. Um, and so we've been many thousands over the entire time. But what we did have was was data from search searches very easily. Um, and uh, we took a look at search data. And if you, if you were to go on Google Trends and search, um, for some of the jurisdictions on which we focused in, in Canada, Manitoba, and in uh, uh, Quebec, and in fact, in Canada as a whole, what you would see, you'd be reminded of the fact that this pandemic, the H1N1 pandemic, had two waves. It had a, um, uh, a, a first wave, which was in the spring of 2019. Um, oh, sorry, 20, 2009, excuse me. Um, uh, and, and then a second wave in the fall of 2009 through the, um, the early parts of 2010. Um, this was a time of great foment. We were building our first epidemiological monitoring system, uh, digital epidemiological monitoring systems on mobile sensors at the same time and recorded contact patterns to the pandemic. But here our focus was in um, was in measuring uh, uh, people's behavior online and their interest. And so what we posited here was that um, searches online, a certain amount of them, not all for any means, maybe not even most, but a certain fraction of them are probably indicative of people's concern. In some cases, anxiety or fear about the pandemic. Um, so whether it searches for symptoms or whether it searches for um, you know, finding out about it, it reflects a certain mind share that might be clue us in to people becoming 
concern. Um, and as such, it might relate to, uh, but not be entirely coextensive with people flowing, say, from the susceptible state uh, to a afraid state, for example, or, or perhaps people who are getting infected and searching for symptoms, um, they would, uh, they, they might be flowing into this afraid infective state. So we wanted to relate, remember one of the ideas with particle filtering is um, if you want to filter based on data from the world, if you want it to be corrected by data from the world, you want it to be informed by, grounded in data from the world, there needs to be something in the model that can be compared with the world. And so, you know, this, this flow here and this flow here could be compared with search data was the idea that that search data might be, you know, a sort of close comparator, at least close cousin of these. And as such, we can compare the two. And it's not that the search data from the world will exactly tell us what this is, but it'll be close enough, it'll add meaningful information that will help shape the model. Um, but beyond that, of course, we had data from the world on cases, and we wanted to bring that data uh, to, to bear as well. And data on cases might be seen as, you know, development of symptoms here, or, 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 or development of symptoms here, people emerging from not just this latent state, but also from their incubation period to, to develop symptoms, and, and as such could be used to ground the model. Um, so we sought to use two types of data for this. First was clinical data, I mean, for, for understanding this, um, of reported cases. We had data on ICU admissions and hospital admissions, um, but, but reported cases are, are, are what we looked at. And I believe this was lab reported cases, if, if memory serves me. Um, but then we had the search data online. Um, uh, for so so this was for Manitoba, excuse me, and this was also for Manitoba, for for Google search and clinic clinic call data. So we had help, uh, we had call in data related to uh, uh, to influenza, um, and uh, we we did so. So we have these two data sources for sort of these red lines on the one hand, these black lines on the other for searching for Manitoba, and we also had it for Quebec. Um, uh, so this is from uh, Info Santé. Uh, and uh, we had case data for the uh, Premier Vague and the Deuxième Vague, the, the two waves uh, within, within uh, Quebec. Um, uh, and I believe this was from uh, INSPQ uh, in, in Quebec. Um, uh, there, there was also some calls to telehealth and, and emergency departments that we, we didn't employ, but we did employ search data for Quebec. Um, and this was, as you might expect, multilingual search data. So it was uh, both um, uh, French and English, uh, uh, English and Francais. Um, uh, and like any particle filtering model, we made use of likelihood functions. Uh, we talked about this yesterday. Remember the idea that for a given particle in a given state, um, we have a way through the likelihood function of asking how likely is it given that state that we'd observe this data from the world. In, in this case, it's given, given the particles assessment of how many people are in each of these states and by extension, how many people are flowing between these because that just depends on, on the state. You may remember that when you have a model like this, um, one of these, these system dynamics and compartmental models, the value of the flows are just a function of, of, of the current value of the state. The state determines those flows. The number of people going down here per day is just the value of this divided by a constant. So, so if you know the state, you know the flows. And, and so, if, if a given particle will have a certain number of people in each of these states and, and between that and the stochastic parameters, it will have a certain number of people flowing down each of these flows. 
And we could, in the likelihood function, say, okay, given that, given that that particle thinks that's the real meal deal, that's the real situation out there in the world, what's the likelihood we would observe this many cases being reported in the past day in this many searches being conducted in the past day? Um, uh, yesterday, we talked about trade-offs between negative binomial and binomial. I won't go into it, but fundamentally here for we made use of two likelihood functions, as you might expect. One for clinical likelihood, or these are sub-likelihood functions. Um, one for clinical likelihood and one for search likelihood. And they had different dispersion parameters. I'm just showing, you know, if you have dispersion parameter equal to 40 here um, for clinical likelihood, um, um, you know, it's fairly accommodating. If it if the particle thinks it should be a thousand, it'll be reasonably accommodating for things that are off even by a factor of, you know, 1.25 or, or what have you. Um, that's a dispersion parameter um, here uh, of 40. Now, for the search, we made use of a smaller dispersion parameter. And I don't know if you remember this from yesterday, but if the dispersion parameter is smaller, it means it's actually wider. It's more accommodating. If the dispersion parameter is much larger as it grows, larger and larger, it becomes thinner and thinner, lighter and lighter, you know, very, very uh, um, sort of peaked. Uh, so here, a dispersion parameter of, point two of, of 25 is um, uh, allows for sort of greater greater accommodation of things that are off here. Um, and I just showed it on the same scale so you can see. Uh, here, you know, 500, you're almost, you have basically no probability of that. Whereas here you have, you know, some, some probability of it. So, so basically we, we said, look, search data is gonna be more variable. We're, we'll be more accommodating for search data being off. Uh, the likelihood will still ascribe a reasonably high likelihood of observing search data, even if it's off by a factor of, of 1.5 from what we observed, um, than we would be for clinical data. Um, we expect clinical data to be more reliable in terms of picking up people, is the idea. Um, and uh, as I recall here, we yes, we had a... Um, uh, a certain, and apologies for going back, but we had a fraction of the incidents. So this is fraction of people, it says incidents, it's actually people getting infected, people going from their latent state exposed to the infective state that is reported. Um, and, and then also we had a fraction of fear cases or anxiety, however you wanna call it within this diagram um, that led to searches. Um, so when people go here, what fraction of them actually um, searched? Um, uh, yeah, it's actually a relative level, but that's enough. And so these were the form of the likelihood functions. You may recall that. Um, what, uh, were the likelihood functions the same across the two provinces? Great question. The answer is yes. We made use of the same likelihood function. And by the way, you can find this all described in the R paper on JMIR. Um, so this is this is 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 laid out in that paper as well. But yeah, they were the same as I recall uh, for the two provinces, which is interesting. Um, you might you might pause it. Um, first of all, we could have made use of some additional Quebec specific information. Um, we had more information about uh, certain types of, of factors there that we could have made. Um, uh, yeah, it's possible. I mean, um, with the likelihood functions being the same, um, I mean, really, I, I wouldn't expect uh, to be different form of likelihood. If you're asking, would the would the um, dispersion parameter um, should that be different? Um, possibly, yes. Um, uh, you might see. Uh, different levels of care seeking, for example, um, in, uh, in, in Quebec than you would in, in Manitoba, or different uh, willingness to use, um, uh, to, to search online, 
uh, for that information. Um, uh, so that's that's a good comment. I, I do think that um, this model could be, so this model was undertaken before we really knew how to make the particle filtering um, sing. And you, you could see some of the results are kind of much rougher than with what someone like um, our group, what, what our group can get these days. Uh, Xiao Yan being a particular master at it, but um, some others in the group also being good. So yeah, I think that that's, that's a reasonable comment. Um, uh, I, th I think we'd need to listen um, uh, to experts in each of those provinces to help us know, um, you know, something about ca case ascertainment in those provinces for influenza, because they might have had a rather distinct um, uh, ascertainment strategies for influenza or different public health messaging strategies, which might have led to um, uh, to greater um, greater numbers of people being uh, accepted. But remember here, the, the, the ascertainment ratio, this fraction of people who are becoming, uh, frankly, symptomatically infective, um, that was actually a dynamic parameter. That wasn't something that was the same between Quebec and Manitoba. What was the same is the dispersion parameter. So how accommodating we were to differences. And I'm, I'm less clear about um, whether that would be a point of high leverage. It, it'd probably be worth considering, yeah, um, examining it. And I certainly think there's a lot that could be tuned up about this. And incidentally, this could be very richly applied as you might expect in the COVID space um, with different specifics uh, for COVID. So you'll recall this from yesterday, but I've, I've adapted it to this particular case. And I just wanna make sure we're on the same page. So each particle has, has a complete belief about the external situation. This is, this is the state factor. This is this, you know, this particle at this time thinks there's a certain number of people in each state of the model, each of those boxes of the model and for each of the dynamic parameters, right? And it has a given weight right now. And each particle has a difference, right? This particle, each of these is a hypothesis about the current situation. So this, this posit, this posits a lot fewer people in fact, in fact, or who are susceptible now than, than P1. P2 thinks a lot of people are, have been infected. A lot more people have been infected, et cetera. Um, uh, now, uh, MP3 is its own hypothesis about the world. And so for each of those particles, there's some expected case count. People number it would think should be infected, should be reported as cases and an expected number of searches. Um, and of course, there's actual observations of these from the world. Um, certain number of clinical cases and a certain number of searches. And this was done separately for Quebec and for, for Manitoba. We had separate models for each of them. Um, and since we have the particle thing, filter thinks is the case versus what is empirically the case, we can apply the likelihood. Remember, that's exactly what the job of the likelihood is. Given the particle state, um, and by extension, its, its expectations, What's the likelihood of observing the empirical data? Well, we could therefore calculate the likelihood for this particle of observing this data or the likelihood of observing that data. Um, and we could do that for each particle. So these are the values of the sub-likelihood functions. It's the value for um, associated with the sub-likelihood. By multiplying them together, you get a composite likelihood and then you multiply that by the weight to get an updated, unnormalized weight, and then you normalize them so they all sum to one. Um, and there might be resampling step that occurs. There. That's the basic particle update. Our two points of observation are clinical cases and searches, and we're updating the particles accordingly. Um, and as you see, this doesn't do great, but it. The point is the relative um, values of this, and so. Um, what I'm going to show below are some graphs, and, and uh, they're of a form that I think you've seen before from Shayan, um, even though they're a lot less uh, pretty 
than some of our, our more recent models. So, so the idea is that um, we're going to have uh, some data that's been considered by the particle filter to a certain point. And then I'm going to use this dotted line to indicate the current point. And I wasn't as careful as Xiaoyan was um, in coloring these data points here separately. But these data points haven't been considered by the particle filtering yet. They're, in fact, they won't be. The model forecasts into this period. This is, these are just shown for comparison. They really should be black by Xiaoyan's conventions. And so this is going to be for case data, and this is going to be for social media data, Okay, searching on social media. So the idea is the particle filter has tried to match all this data, and now we're just projecting forward uh, from this. And we'll see if it you know, has predictive validity going forward in light of what it's learned. That was the idea. OK, so, so we'll examine this situation, giving the model different sets of data. So suppose we particle filter using only clinical likelihood. This is what we got. The model, if we particle filter with that, it's great as long as it goes, and then guess what? It it it's too diffuse. It you know the particles are kind of spread here. This is why I said it really needs some tuning these days. Shaoyan could beat this thing into shape easily, probably in about a day. Um, but um, you know, eventually it knows. Okay, it's going to decrease. Um, and same thing with kind of the searching. It expects a certain amount of searching, and yeah, eventually it gets down to zero. But in the meantime, it's so diffuse, it's, it's like has no sense of self-efficacy. This is a model with like no sense of self-efficacy. It just says, I don't know. I don't know using the clinical data. Um, this is a bit embarrassing, but it was one of our first explorations. But the really interesting thing is look at the differences between these two. Um, and that's what I, I wanna get to here. Here with only clinical uh, likelihood for Manitoba, and you see something similar. It's just all over the map. I mean, this is this is embarrassing. Uh, uh, it's, it's Shaoyan, we paging Shaoyan. Um, uh, uh, and uh, here's with only search likelihood. Okay, well, let's look. It, it just like it matches the search data, but it's totally out to lunch with the clinical data. This is something that's just kind of interesting, right? Like the clinical data, if we ground it with, so if we only have one likelihood function, that's what this is showing, a single likelihood function for, for clinical, um, we can actually match, for, as long as they continue the data points, the uh, clinical likelihood, uh, oh, sorry, the clinical observations, the number of cases, and we can match the search data quite well. Um, after that, in the projection regime, it's like uh, I can't match not you know I can't match anything. Um, if we give it only a clinical likelihood for Manitoba, we can do quite well with the clinical data, but you know we don't do well with the uh, search data. We do we kind of undershoot it. If we give it only search data, if we're only considering searching, we're, we're ignoring the clinical data. It just goes out to lunch, like for predicting the number of cases. It, it thinks the number of cases is shooting up early. Uh, naturally, it matches the, um, the, the search data pretty well. And actually, in the future regime, it matches it pretty well, too. And uh, same thing with, with, um, with search data. So, you know, an important lesson here is like, um, if you're going to consider types of data, you're, you're generally better off with, with clinical data. It, it will often, not always, it will often allow you to do, um, to not only match clinical cases, it will allow you to match search data um, uh, as well. Uh, you know, search data alone, trying to judge it based on search data alone for this model just didn't cut it um, as a data source. Now you could ask search data and Twitter data, how would that do? And this is interesting, but it, it didn't didn't do um, didn't do great. Now though, let's look at the two likelihood functions. Okay, so this is interesting, and this is the most important <coughs> message <coughs> from this that 
you know, if you considered clinical data alone, either for Manitoba or Quebec, <coughs> you're really not doing well for projecting either. You're doing okay for, for matching up clinical data. Um, but, you know, in the projection regime, you're doing very poorly. With both, so if you take that clinical data and you combine in this search data, the search data that's out to lunch when it comes to, you know, guiding it alone. I mean, it's just, it's just horrible, right? Guiding clinical data alone. But that actually really helps the ability to project clinical data. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than if you have clinical data alone for either Quebec or for Manitoba. So search data is by itself is, doesn't get us very far for clinical data at all. Um, and and you know, clinical data is, is far better, but doesn't give us this projection picture. But if you combine both of them, now you're actually doing not horribly embarrassing. I mean, you're, you're actually doing just vastly better for Manitoba and you're doing it better uh, for, for not only clinical data, for not only comparison with clinical data, projecting forward cases, you're doing better for projecting forward searches as, as well. Um, and the same thing is true for Quebec. Um, it's, not, it's not great, but it's vastly better than what we saw before. Um, and it captures you know, the timing of the down sweep. Um, it, it tends to underestimate it, but it still includes this within its broad envelope. I think this was done with a thousand particles or something. It was, it was kind of embarrassingly small. We were still learning our sea legs. But the, the really sobering thing here, or the really thing that requires you know, reflection is that Normally we would think of search data as low quality, right? And, and you know, evidence with search data alone is suggestive of it does not provide good guidance to, to judging clinical cases, that it misleads us with respect to clinical cases. You could be excused for looking at this and saying, if we use search data, we're gonna be misled with clinical cases for both Manitoba and Quebec. It, that's that'd be a reasonable first order, you know, sort of impression from this, right? Um, it's not going to help us for our clinical data. That's easy to uh, appreciate why someone might think that, but it's incorrect. Bringing in search data with clinical data, combining in a comparatively high quality data source with a comparatively noisy, low quality one that by itself can be misleading because of their complementarity, because they have different information, they can actually have us do far, far better. So this, is a, this points to a truth that was discovered in bioinformatics in the 1990s um, when I was dabbling a bit in bioinformatics. Uh, so I started my work with dynamic modeling in 1990, um, dates myself. And um, by the late 90s, this is field of bioinformatics was starting up. And there was uh, a coming together of people from two radically different backgrounds, um, from biologists, molecular biologists, um, and uh, microbiologists, um, who had their set of traditions. Um, biochemists on the one hand and computer scientists and so on. Um, and I went to some early conferences in that area and there was a real culture clash. Um, and biologists, um, I know because I'm married to a biochemist, an MD, PhD, PhD in, in biochemistry. Um, uh, and she, um, you know, she's conveyed to me and 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 it's clear from the culture at the time that you know in biochemistry you would do extremely intricate very carefully controlled experiments um uh, and uh, a huge amount of attention was paid 
to, to getting the very highest quality evidence. And when bioinformatics came in, suddenly you started to be able to tap into uh, additional data sources that would, would be viewed as lower quality. And as time went on, it went to you know, gene expression chips and, and data, you know, noisy data from sequencing, et cetera. And there was a culture clash with, with biochemists and biologists feeling like this is going to contaminate our really high quality data. You know, we, we go through all this effort to collect this data and very high quality experiments. And you're talking about bringing in this very noisy data set that's got, you know, um, who knows what sort of biases in it and noises in it. And, um, and you're telling us that that's going to help? No, it's going to, you know, it's going to corrupt our data. It's like mixing in lead with gold, melt, molten lead with molten into molten gold or something. It's going to, you know, uh, it's going to pollute, contaminate sort of the quality of our, of our work and, and impede our clarity. And um, one, of the, one of the foremost things that happened in those formative years was bioinformatics was a sorting out of this conflict. And what it was shown was that the point that was made was that if you have a data set that's lower quality, but it's bringing different information to bear than another data set that's higher quality. You actually can get something that's better yet by combining the two. And this is known in statistics where if you have you know, one distribution um, where you, you uh, have a certain mean and a wider variance, and you get an estimate for the mean for that, and then you have another distribution, same mean, but a, 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 excuse me, a much wider variance yet, um, and, you, and you have uh, the same mean, and you estimate the mean from that, um, even though the second data set has a much greater vari variance associated with it, and therefore the estimate of the mean is, is lower quality, it's, it's, it's not as high quality, um, uh, with the same number of samples, it actually, helps you to combine the two estimates. Um, it doesn't corrupt the higher quality one with the smaller variance by bringing in data from the distribution with the larger variance. You bring in additional information. And in this case, as in bioinformatics, you bring in data from multiple data sources. And this is really what swept away the old way of doing things in bioinformatics and led to radically new ways, which leverage all sorts of data sources to triangulate to give a picture of what's going on. High quality, low quality, all different data sources, each bring different information to the table. Each bring information that shed light on different aspects of the situation where the errors would be different and, and so on that collectively illuminated the underlying situation. And that's what's going on here. Is search data low quality? Yeah, it's, it's low quality. Um, uh, by itself, it does a really poor job. Um, but it can help clinical data actually do better in terms of projecting forward, in terms of matching clinical data. It can help. And that's true across both these jurisdictions. Um, uh, and it turns out this is, um, this, is, uh, this is true with some further experiments as well um, in terms of projecting forward from later times. So, you know, uh, in the paper, we report on these matters, but uh, the, fundamental, the fundamental factor is that the predictive accuracy of this model rises when you bring in the, the ability to predict, the predictive accuracy as judged with respect to case data rises when you bring in search data. Search data helps you better predict clinical data even though search data by itself is far, far less efficacious in terms of matching clinical data. Um, bringing it in helps better match clinical data. So, um, you know, just an observation here about bringing in big data. Big data is noisy. It's, um, it's, it's often got, uh, you know, serious limitations associated with it, but, it can help 
actually sharpen our vision when it complements other data sources. So the name of the game here, in my view, is to combine in a savvy way multiple data sources that each capture different aspects about the underlying situation, different types of information to jointly illuminate the underlying situation, um, jointly shed light on this latent state of the system that's the job of particle filtering to estimate. Okay, so, um, so that was one um, case study. Any questions about that before I go on to a separate case study? Um, which uh, is also going to be provocative in its implications. Any questions I could answer about that? Okay, um, I'm not seeing any. Um, I would note that these sorts of methods. Um, are ones which are highly applicable in today's context. Um, social media data, search data, data from wastewater, clinical data where it's available. I think of the tools of art right now when it comes to something like COVID-19, but I would go beyond that. I would say for mental health issues, for, for addictions issues, et cetera, we can turn to many of those same sources, sorts of data for, for shedding light on hidden burdens of, of distress, of, um, of need for services, of, um, um, of you know, levels of, uh, of ideation that are otherwise hard to measure. And, and we can use tools like this to kind of put these together into multiple peace bills. Um, uh, so, Jan, um, uh, so um, should an enthusiastic epidemiologist venture alone and, and, and particle filter be recommended to get a help from biostatistician? Um, uh, so the truth is particle filtering is not, it, it, you know, you're glimpsing it for the first time but with a couple days of kind of training and how to tune a model, you can learn to make it sing. It's, it's not, this is not a black art where you got to know all sorts of fancy stuff and where it takes years of education or whatever. I, I think, I, honestly, I, I think it's a bit like um, learning how to, um, I, I don't know if I'm tempted to say learning how to ski or, learning how to skate or, you know, like you, you got to learn, learn by trial, trialing things. And I think, you know, I would suggest you, you, you pair up with someone for a couple of days and you learn how to, how to tune it and you work with them to build up a model and you can, um, you can readily do this sort of analysis. Like the, this is not, um, really gnarly. There, there are areas I work which are, are really gnarly where I wouldn't suggest, you know, um, going um, like, like I wouldn't suggest looking to yourself to be the one who can tune it. But this, you can actually learn to tune this stuff. It's not, it's not that, that hard. It's, uh, again, it, it's like learning to drive a go-kart or something like, like that. Okay, I'm, I'm not learning to cook. Uh, maybe that's a better example. It's like learning to cook. Like people can, you know, may take a few uh, burnt eggs or something, but you can learn to cook pretty well um, by by some trialing there. But you want someone for something like this who can work with you to get you your sea legs, and then you can you can tune it. Now, for building the particle filter model up from the ground, I think you probably want to do that with someone to to help you with some of the specifics. The truth is, though, and I really need to get it up on the site. Like we've been using these templates for our particle filter models, and it has high degree of conservation for from one model to another. Um, what I mean by this is like you take that template and you can use it for a new area by keeping maybe fifty percent of it, and and there's a stuff there's a set of stuff that's exactly the same, and then there's a set of stuff that just has to be modified in a very boilerplate way. 
you know, it's like, oh, okay, this, the stocks in this model, the compartments in this model are these ones instead of those ones that were in the past model. So I'll just systematically, you know, go through and, and use the ones for this model. And then there's some things that are quite specific, like your likelihood functions, and you want some guidance with that. But the truth is, it's, it's not rocket science. It's actually something which, um, with the right partnership and, and, and some help, you can get you can get going on your own and then you can become, you know, develop, uh, as Chinese would say, gung fu. You can develop, you know, a, a very, very strong sort of degree of, of intuition and capability and kind of excellence with it um, that allows it to perform really well. That's more of a kind of um, like learning a skill. It's like learning a manual skill. You can learn to, to kind of tweak it. And you learn to kind of think like a particle filter. <laughs> Um, you, you learn to think like, why is it thinking that way? Um, you want someone to show it to, but no, you could you could be a, a lead person for that side. It's it's not it's not that hard. Building it up though, I think you want to work very closely with someone. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll I'll provide the template. Um, I provide them in other cases of teaching this, and um, I had initially planned to have a walkthrough of a template. I don't think we'll have time today but I can release a video where I'm walking through said template, you know, systematically, oh, this part does this, this part does this, this is just boilerplate you reuse totally, this one you adapt in this very regular way, um, et cetera. Um, yeah, and, and someone like Chayan could help you with it. Uh, there are several others on the call also uh, that could uh, could help, help you learn your way through it. Jalen, um, uh, Wade, uh, have, have all done work uh, of this sort and um, uh, probably, I'm, I'm not sure who's on right now, but probably several others as well. So yeah, glad to, uh, glad to help with that. Um, okay, so we're